Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. Josh, alcoholic. Gosh, what big shoes to fill. Howard's, you know, but like he always talked about spirit, energy, he's not gone. It just changed. And uh, Ralph, so good to see you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I was, uh, and I'm sorry I couldn't be here with you all the whole weekend. I, uh, I had a wedding. I got to marry one of my sponsees off to his bride yesterday and uh, for $39.99 at universallifechurch.com. Uh, <clears throat> So, <laughs> it was it was a wonderful event. I hope we can laugh together, um, because that's what uh, this entire journey has been for me. My sobriety date is July first, two thousand and three. Uh, my sponsor is a guy named Bill C, and my home group's the Hermosa Beach Men's Stag. And we meet Monday night at eight thirty. And if you're ever in the area, come on down, and you'll hear laughter and inappropriate humor. But at the end of the night, there's about seventy five percent of the room that raised their hand for sponsorship. So uh, we believe heavily in that, and uh, I've had the privilege of, of being in other places with several people in the crowd, and, uh, you know, one of the things I wanted to say about Ralph, since he doesn't want to toot his own horn, I'll toot it for him, is just, he is just so silently and diligently working in the background all the time. He's like a little Yoda, and uh, <laughs> so wise, and so patient, and... Uh, and it's very true, you know, and he just sits down and knows how to get into the meat of it with a guy. Doesn't need to toot his own horn. So that's where I come in. I'm a, to- I'm a horn tooter. I haven't uh, outgrown it yet. And uh, I don't know when the rascal's going away, but he seems to be alive and well, uh, well into this thing. So I, briefly, I grew up briefly. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. But... <laughs> It was a dark and stormy night. No. Uh, I grew up in, uh, in Washington State in an alcoholic household, and uh, my dad was a drunk, and he kind of destroyed every opportunity he ever had. He had a very promising intellect and uh, lots of opportunities that came about from that, and uh, he systematically, in the pursuit of whatever it is, this mind-made hole we try to fill with fluid, um, he ended up destroying a lot of things for our lives and his life. And, and so my mom ended up leaving that situation. When he would drink, he was great. He was a very insecure guy, you know. So he'd think my mom was trying to cheat on him or my mom was looking at other men. He'd try to fight people in public. He'd, you know, and a lot of us, when we get sober, we have that too. Me as a man getting sober, I had this jealousy in me and this possessiveness not understanding what love is at all, or even intimacy is at all. I wanted to own everything that I gave my attention to. And, uh, and so my father never got a chance to confront that. And my mom had to bail, you know. She had a little kid to look out for, and we, she got remarried quickly. And this is where it's important, because this growing in effectiveness and, and uh, growing in understanding with this power that we access here, the power, uh, the flow, the Tao, the uh, the Holy Spirit, the Buddha nature, whatever you want to call it, right? The thing to understand is that we're human beings and we have language. And oftentimes, without realizing it, most of us are arguing over semantics. And if you climb down into the heart of a human being who's using a word, he's oftentimes meaning the same thing I'm meaning, you know? But we just have these divisions of ideology separate us from getting to the essence of what's really going on. And in AA, too, in AA, too. You know, live and let live. It's live and let live, you know. (laughs) So I just want to like, I'm a rascal a bit. So I just want you guys to know that you're all right the way you are. You know, the train hasn't left the station and uh, it's all working itself out, you know. Um, but anyway, so this is where it's important, though, about God and about this whole thing, because my mom remarried quickly to the son of a gunsmith from Billings, Montana, cowboy, you know, true blue American. And uh, he was a youth pastor at the church, among many other things. And we, we got dragged four times a week to church. 
And, uh, and then we got the piss beat out of us as soon as the sun went down. So that was my childhood, right? It's like heavy abuse and then Jesus. And then heavy abuse and then more Jesus. And then us showing up and everyone being like, man, you guys are about the Jesus's family I've ever seen, you know? You guys are really pious and really connected and you all look so happy and your house is all so nice. And it was a one, it was a big lie. And, uh, and so at that time, uh, lots of violence occurred there. And I don't know how much I need to dwell there, you know, because I know I'm not the only one who grew up with abuse and Alcoholics Anonymous. And I know that that's not the reason I'm an alcoholic. But I'll tell you what, by the time I got to AA, uh, I had a rap sheet of psychological data that had been given to me by m- tons of doctors, you know, in the effort to try to unveil what was bothering me. What, why, so they gave me names for all my conditions, right? And they gave me, I, I was bipolar. I was, po- I had post-traumatic stress disorders, what they used to call it, you know, or syndrome. Uh, and they called it manic depression when they gave it to me at 11 years old. You know, they pumped me up full of medication, uh, oppositional defiance disorder, which just means you're an asshole. Uh, <laughs> still dealing with that one. <laughs> But I've learned to code it with humor, you know, Um, and and I did not know at that time that uh, that 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 stuff might be able to be the trajectory might be able to be corrected with a spiritual way of life. Right. I am not a guy who believes in discussing medication at AA in the either or. I believe that if you're on medication, you're perfectly, you're allowed to do that. And I support your journey. And please use the psychiatrist when it comes to guys in the program, because I don't sponsor women, um, because I know who I am. You know, I know who I am. And that's not to say that other men can't sponsor women, because this is an ecology. There is a place for everyone. It always works itself out. Every time there's a guy who someone shares something in the meeting and the new guy leaves and you're that one person who's like, look at them. They're not carrying the message and now the newcomer just got offended and walked out, right? They're sharing it wrong. They're doing it wrong. If they were just not full of shit or they weren't full of it, they might be able to, you know what I mean, carry a message with depth and weight and this newcomer wouldn't be dying. And uh, that's what you think. But then someone's out in the parking lot and catches them and they sit there and start smoking a cigarette. And it's, I've watched it happen a thousand times where you think things are going wrong and they're just going right in a different direction. And so, um, you know, I, uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, this whole spiritual journey uh, has been a difficult one for me because I have, I have attempted to get better um, in the direction of someone else's advice. And sometimes I've chosen the wrong people to try to emulate for me, right? Not for them, because it's an ecology. Everyone belongs here. Everyone belongs here. And so a lot of this spiritual journey has been about finding out what resonates with my heart, not what necessarily resonates with what all you guys are talking about and how I can get accepted into the tribe, right? That's to thine own self be true. It's just a line that I, when I was you, or new, used to do whatever the hell I wanted, right? It's like, look, man, I understand what you're trying to do here, sir, but to thine own self be true. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but now it means something a little different, right? Um, and that man, uh, you know, I, all that abuse and all that stuff I brought into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was gravely and emotionally uh, and uh, mentally disordered. And I'm telling you, I haven't been on medication since I was 21, You know, I was able to work with a psychiatrist and it was crazy for a while. And I still am a little, you know, a little bit every once in a while. I'll wake up with a deep pit of depression in my stomach. I'll, uh, and, and there's no, and sometimes depression is a, is a natural emotional response to making the wrong decision, right? Or to mistreating someone like, or to just being a rascal in the wrong direction. Um, and today my rascality is a bit more benign. You know, it's that my heart's in the right place most of the time. And I'm, and I'm gentler with myself. And I guess that's really been what the journey is, is learning how to give love to the ugly pieces instead of coming to AA and trying to give you guys my best face and then taking my secrets home with me and then judging myself for them when I'm sitting here in a meeting. What I found in AA, at least in my journey, when I'll tell you a little bit more about it. No, I'm just going to preach. Uh, just joking. And, uh, but... 
But my journey in Alcoholics Anonymous, my experience is the most righteous I ever had been in Alcoholics Anonymous, which is to say sanctimonious, righteous in the judgmental way, was the most deeply secretive and and diseased time in my life. I was doing so much stuff behind closed doors when I was coming to AA being super righteous. So just take that and do what you want with it. Uh, and... And so when I know someone's a little bit of a rascal, I feel like I can trust them, <laughs> you know? I know that, like, sometimes, sometimes for me, myself, I remember when someone explained to me and I was knew that I was arrogant. I could not conceive of such a thing. <laughs> it, it made no sense to me. I said, no, wait, 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 what? I'm arrogant? You know? I'd like, no, this guy's arrogant, that's arrogant, that's arrogant to even say. And, uh, but you don't know until you know. And, and so I guess what this whole journey of the 12 steps, it's hard to look at each one of them. I am not a tactician when it comes to the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe that when I'm reading with my guys, they do a good enough fourth and fifth step. They get out there and start to make some of those amends. You know, they do them wrong. <laughs> they call you and, and then you get them on the 10th step and you tell them to continue to look for fear and selfishness and resentment and all these things that play us out of pocket. And each one of us comes with a different set of demons that sit on our shoulder, you know. And so, and then you help people. You, you turn your thoughts to other people when that happens. You, you learn how to live an observed style of life. You, you see that when you're in a relationship, you shouldn't go to the bank right after working out in the tank top and wait for the cute teller to take your order when you could just go deposit it out front, you know? There's some motivational issues in that scenario. <laughs> There's, uh, like, things like that. That's 10th step stuff, you know? And continuing 10, 10 to 11 because they're, they're joined, you know, and there's a whole bunch of people who would love to get in an argument <laughs> about the particulars of this step. And I think those people have completely missed the point, completely missed the point. You know, L knowing the words of a thing are not the same as experiencing the truth of a thing. And so there is a spirit of the law. I am a spirit of the law, not a letter of the law kind of guy. Um, but I wasn't always that way. It wasn't always that way. So uh, when that whole religious thing happened, um, I remember when I was eight years old, I threw away my Bible. And I remember dropping it in the trash and going, "Any this God crap, it's not going to happen. I see right through it. See that this is a social club. This is a pageant of righteousness. This is, a, you know, a, a measuring contest of spiritual organs, <laughs> right? And... Uh, <laughs> And, and so I decided, I'm really glad I kept that without us profanity, you know? That was like an intelligent way to do it, right? Can I get a little bit of, yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and, um, and so moving on from there, I remember my mom and I, after one night of abuse again, I got knocked unconscious. My mom finally came to a, a head, and we, my, my stepfather... Um, got incarcerated and we packed up a U-Haul and drove down in the dead of night. And I was like so tiny I could sleep in the footwell of the U-Haul truck on blankets like a little dog. And um, we came and we didn't have any money and we slept in the back of a, a pickup truck camper shell in someone's front yard that my mom knew from school. And um, she got her feet together and she, or she got on her feet and she got her stuff together and got a job at uh, the place she used to work. Um, and before long, we had our own place again, and my dad came back into my life, and uh, my mom kept on trying to take me to church, but man, whatever had happened there, whatever they tried to teach me just never fit the same, you know? I just understood, and, I, and there, was no, there was a lot of judgment, a lot of anger there. It's so much anger for God. It's so much anger for man, you know? I remember on my first four-step, my very first resentment on my first four-step was the sun, for sustaining life on human earth, or I mean on earth, right? Organic life. Like, I just start from the top if you're going to be grandiose with your resentment, right? What is the thing that's even allowed single-cell organisms to evolve into multicellular organisms? So I, uh, that's how I was always. I was just over the top with everything. And when I, when I despised religion and when I despised spirituality and when I despised the concept of God... Um, I did it with grandiosity, and I did it, like, with my whole heart, you know? 
And uh, my dad came back into my life, and we tried to connect, and we did for a brief time, and then he died when I was 10, and that's when things went really bad. And I started smoking cigarettes and running away from home and destroying all the religious artifacts in the house and all that. My mom, she came home, and all her crosses are turned upside down, you know? And, uh, and everyone's like, this is, you have Damien. And she's taking me to therapist this entire time because I was drawing pictures of monsters and demons and dead bodies when I was in pre-K, you know? And they're like, what's wrong with this kid? Everyone else is drawing a picture of the dog. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was screwed up, the whole situation. And, um, and they told my mom, you need to get this kid some help, serious help. You know, have you ever heard of a guy named Ted Bundy? You know, you need to, like, correct this trajectory, mama. And, um, and I, was just, I was just a dark, weird guy. I think anyone who grew up in the set of circumstances I, I did would understand that. If you walked in my shoes, you would understand. And it's not in a justification way anymore. It's just this is my story. These are the, this is the river that has rounded this stone. And, um, and so I am okay with who I am now, only through the journey of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's ongoing, right? And the guys, another thing, brief aside. Another, like when guys come to me, they work the steps and they come to me and they want to go through the steps again right away. I tell them to go sponsor someone. You know, I'm telling you guys, you can look in the steps all day long for all you, but it becomes a self-centered pursuit. I'm going to do more inventory. This is where step 10 can be a big, you know, snag. You know, I'm going to constantly review all my stuff every night about me, 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 me. Well, I've learned so much more about myself this time, you know, me, 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 me. And I'm just saying we're missing the whole point. We're missing the whole point. The steps are not a self-centered pursuit. The steps are a set of spiritual exercises that can release us from the chain of self, right? And to be released from the chain of self, there's like a freedom in that. There's a freedom in not having to constantly be right. I am not in control of anything, you know? And yet I live in two places. With this 11th step, I understand that maybe perhaps I am part of the control of all things. It's a part of me too. But there's two parts. There's the little I and there's the great I, the I am, if you're religious, huh? There is this essence, this spark. There's a thing in me and a thing in you that quiets down when certain words are spoken in a certain way, that listens, that hears an echo. And that's not you learning, that's you remembering because it's already in you and it's been in you forever. It's innate in us. And so that's the freedom and the journey in the 11th step is starting to see that, man, it's not so bad being me. This is just temporary. I'm wearing this skin suit with this stupid hair and this funny beard, you know, and this and, and I'm just this is my little journey through life. And it's very easy to get wrapped around the axle of the, the woes and the the hardships that come, but I'm telling you that I'm convinced that all of my suffering has been a catalyst for compassion, that there is no other way to become compassionate than suffering. We suffer and we become compassionate. I have been through heartache, and so when I see someone who goes through heartache, I'm so compassionate, you know? I've survived the death of people who I dearly love, and because I have survived that, I am so compassionate when someone feels that loss. And also, after having survived so much pain in sobriety and before, and, and so much suffering, either self, self-enforced or, you know, circumstantial, I have a faith that the pain others go through are, is not an event that they need saving from on my account. It's part, so there's a freedom that comes on all ends. You know, where I understand that, hey, I can support someone and love them through their pain and love them through their suffering, but understanding that I don't have to be the one that saves them because they are already saved. They've been saved. They are saved, right? So to go back a little bit, um, when my dad died and all that stuff happened, you fast forward to 12 and I'm smoking cigarettes and running away from home and I got big blue Liberty spikes in my hair, right? And I'm giving my mom and anyone who talks to me the finger, and uh, and she picks me up and tells me my grandpa has got had a heart attack. And so I cuss her out the whole way to the hospital because she picks me up from my friend's house. And we go into this tiny little hospital, and there's no one in the waiting room but me being an idiot 12-year-old who's just like, hey, leave me alone, I'm angsty, you know? And uh, we go through this back hallway, and the door shuts, and the deadbolt slides, and I'm in a mental institution. <laughs> 
Mama got cold, you know what I'm saying? She, <laughs> she tricked me into that one. And, uh, and so that's where I learned about all my demons. That's where I learned about what they call the things that bothered me. And that's where they put me on all the medication. And I did that for six months when I was 12 years old. And uh, got transferred to a residential treatment center. And while I was there, uh, I fell in love with a girl from, that was three years older. And I slid poetry under her door. And I was going to move to Texas and all this. And I was 12, you know, just it was complete, just ki a kid. You're just a kid. You don't know any better. You're just stuck in a mental institution and trying to create a fantasy to help you survive, you know? And, uh, and you're hopped up on an incredible amount of medication, you know, that makes things among, among, it makes a lot of things difficult and among them drinking. I'll get to that. Drinking was hard on all those meds. It screwed with my stomach. Eventually the only thing that I could put down and keep down with regularity was 211 still reserve, you know, and that was my drink of choice. I loved it. It got me drunk and it didn't make me feel like an alien was about to burst from my solar plexus. <laughs> and, uh, so while I was in there, I... I, uh, I got falsely accused for something for maybe the very first thing I didn't do and got yelled at, but it was too much, you know, it was too much. This girl didn't love me. Uh, I didn't, my dad was dead. I got beat. My mom abandoned me in a mental institution. Boo, hoo, 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 hoo. And so I grabbed some shoelaces and I put them around my neck and I put them against the hinges of a solid core door and I held my ankles up at my hips and I just kind of rocked there and felt everything go away. And uh, pins and needles and peace is what it was. There was peace there. I didn't feel that kind of peace again until I took my first drink, you know. And uh, I lost my nerve and had a welt on my neck. And they asked me what had happened. And it came out in the wash that, you know, I wasn't in the one who had done the thing that I was in trouble for. And I forgot. And I remembered again when I had my first drink, when 12 years old in Andrew Gedman's garage, almost immediately after I got out of the mental institution, because I learned about drinking and using there. All those kids were dual diagnosed. They all had a girlfriend or boyfriend that was on the outside, and they were all just waiting to burn the world down together. And I just fell in love with that idea. You know, you just pull up two lawn chairs and watch it all go aflame. And, um, and so, not that that idea has followed me into my sober relationships ever. <laughs> Now that I've ascended, uh, it's nice to fondly recall what it used to be like seen from such limited perspective. Uh, <laughs> it's <clears throat> So that happened, and I started drinking, man. And when I drank, oh, God, none of, all that stuff fell away. I was willing to risk everything. I was willing to risk everything to get... And I did other things, too. I did meth one time, you know, for two years. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> And so drinking and, and doing this other stuff all the time. And next thing you know, I'm getting kicked out of high school. I'm hanging out with murderers. I'm like, I got kicked out of continuation school. I got asked to stop coming to independent studies. I had the beginning of formal education of the beginning of 11th grade, you know, uh, until I got sober and they made me get a GED in adult school in Torrance. Uh, but I was, I left, I left, the, I, the education system had abandoned me, the psychiatric system had abandoned me, but what I was destined, I mean, I was practicing Kung Fu, I went, here's the best part, the best part, besides all that, is that I kept drinking to the point, and, and I would watch Braveheart over and over and over again, right, and the 13th Warrior, and I played in a black metal band, so, if, so I would dress in paint, and go into the woods, and I had like an eight foot battle axe I'd take pictures with, just drunk off my ass, and, uh, and, and, and I was in a solo project, which means that all the bands I had tried to start, I couldn't get along with anyone. So I controlled all facets of the music. And, um, and around this time, my mom, seeing that I needed some kind of focusing agency in my life, decided to re-enroll me in the same mental institution I'd visited as a child, but now as an adult. So every morning, Carlos would come by in the white van and beep the horn, and I'd, like, put down my text on demonology, <laughs> you know, and, like, <laughs> walk outside and, like, go with the schizophrenics to go play at the recess yard all day and bring in drugs. I had to make amends to the mental institution for sneaking in marijuana to get all the schizophrenics high on the yard, you know? So, like, 
I was just always getting, it was just always weird with me. And I met a guy there, and next thing I know, I'm practicing kung fu with this guy who's a paranoid schizophrenic, who's like six foot three, an ex-marine specialist. And uh, my mom is proud, what can I say, you know? I, <laughs> I was just living in a fantasy, is what I'm trying to illustrate for you. I was living in this strange world where, like, I would... I thought I was, I was writing a manifesto, I'd created my own religion, and I became convinced that like I should have been born a thousand years ago. I should have been raiding the Carolingian Empire, and I was actually the incarnation of a Viking warlord. So, uh, full flight from reality, right? But it made a kind of sense to me. It made a kind of sense to me. It made me, made me feel like instead of walking through this entire life with two left feet, that maybe that was the answer, that I was displaced in time. You know, when two Vikings, one of them craps their pants on the longboat, it's really not that big of a deal. And uh, I felt like I would have felt better and fit in better at that time period. And so, uh, and so grace entered my life in the form of my mother begging me to go to a 30-day program. And it was pretty much she had gotten a lot of support from other people. Really, my mom, she just felt so guilty my whole life for all the abuse I'd suffered as a child that I was able to play her like a fiddle, right, and get what I wanted. And every time what I wanted wasn't ever good for me because given the choice, I always choose what's easy. You know, to go into the literature, I always choose comfort over character building every day of the week. And knowing that about myself still today, I like to be lazy. I like to be doted upon. I like attention. I like to be the speaker. I like it. It makes me feel good, you know? And it can be dangerous. And to not acknowledge it can be twice as dangerous. To know that about ourselves, right? And just own it. If you own who you are, no one could ever use it against you. And that's kind of what the ninth step is about, in a way, right? In a big way. It's like you, you, you go out and you, you make the amends and you own who you are and you continue to try to change your behavior and you try to make right what you can and you stand tall. Slowly but surely with the power helping, you stand tall. And, uh, and so all that stuff went down and I came to this house and this house was like Stepford Wives and AA was like Stepford Wives times 10. And I thought all you guys just went into a closet and plugged up at night, you know? Everyone's saying the same damn thing over and over again. It's all live and let live and, you know, easy does it and keep coming back. It works if you work it and you hold hands and you pump your palms with each other like a bunch of chimpanzees. And I just thought to myself, what is this zoo? What is this crap? These people, this is church all over again. I don't want anything to do with it. Uh, and there just didn't seem like there was much of an independent thought process or any sort of deductive reasoning present throughout the, the group. Uh, and here I was, obviously, coming straight off of the Viking fantasy, thinking that I had <laughs> a more illumined perspective on the nature of reality. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the love of perfect strangers transformed me, right? And um, I have really bad eyes. Is there any way to know how much time I have left so I can scoot myself along? 25 more minutes? Thank you. And so in this transformation that started to take place, I remember around my first year cake, you know, I, I, I had done the force. I just had started my fourth step at one year sober. I refused to work the steps for a long time. And I watched everyone else get better. And I was sitting there feeling worse and worse. I would fall asleep and pray to die. And I would wake up and be pissed the whole rest of the day that I had survived. And... Uh, and I was stuck in a house with 30 other guys, too, and all of them are just doing the deal. Doing the deal. When are you doing? I'm doing the deal. Uh, and I just wanted to shoot them all, you know. I just, God. And I'm sitting there just miserable, chewing my inner lip and looking at them and just seeing through it all. And uh, something happened to me. Something happened to me. I was taking a one-year cake, and they put me on all these programs to modify my behavior. And, and one of these guys called, yelled, miracle. And, uh, and I realized that I'd been sober for a year. And I just, one of the things I always had, even though I hated the system, right, rebel to the last, a.k.a. emotional immaturity, <laughs> um, I can't see the advantage of tech, the technology of fitting in and listening and being cooperative. I can't see that that's actually a technology that I can apply to the tribal situation. 
and to get and to get along with other people and to have have a result come back to me in my favor you know it's very interesting what how you look at the world when the emotional scale is removed when you realize that the only problem i ever have is in relation to me and if you remove me you can evaluate that's 10 and 11 for me too I try to remove myself and see what the end game is. What's the goal, not the short-term return, right? The short-term return is the thing that always gets me back. And the short-term return has a lot to do with me living in one or two places a lot. Like this morning, I woke up in comparison instead of gratitude. Comparison or gratitude? Comparison or gratitude? Looking at other people, wondering how I measure up. Coming to this place, I couldn't come and hang out with you guys the whole weekend. I'm here this morning. That made me feel insecure this morning. I walked in and wondered, are these people going to judge me for like not being a part of? And you feel like f- forced to sit down and hang. And it's always fun, right? It's always fun to see everyone, talk to everyone, and be a part of the AA and our community. But sometimes you can't. You think, gosh, am I going to look like an asshole coming in like this? And I just want them to love me. And you go down deep enough, deep, 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 deep down enough. That's always my motivation for almost everything. When I hurt people, when I do the wrong thing, when I make a short-term gain, you know, that at the expense of the long-term emotion, it's always, I just want that little boy that got locked in his room and beat and, and, you know, fed the Bible the next day. That little boy just wants love. And, uh, and I learned that as a result of that, I also feel like I'm unworthy of love. I learned in this 10th and 11th step last time, you know, I have this secret belief system and this belief system makes me make decisions to reconfirm it over and over and over again. I don't think I deserve love. And so I choose a woman who will never give it to me. You know, I don't think I deserve success. And so I will always settle at the job I'm at and never take the risk of building something. And so evaluating that, here's the funniest part about belief, and this is all the 11th step. If you sit in silence and observe the mind, you start to see all sorts of stuff. And I have seen, you know, that my beliefs are a set of circumstances that have occurred over and over and over again to reinforce a certain way of thinking. That's it. Neurologically, that's all I am. Is a collection of habits that have been given to me by my society and my parents and my, or my rebellion against those things. And I'm equally trapped in an opposite image, right? But it's just a set of circumstances I got in me. And if, I, and if I removed the, the childhood abuse, if I removed the mental institution, if my father was still alive, those are three huge events that happened in my life. You remove either one of those, you'd have a completely different person sitting here, you know? I'd be completely different. And if my personality is that fragile, what the hell do I waste so much time defending it for? If it's that fragile, why do we sit here and try to cling and hold on and pretend like because we know it, it's real? (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) It's not. (laughs) It doesn't work that way. And so living there is scary. It's a little scary. Some hearts might have closed when I said that because I did it a little jabby. I apologize. (laughs) You know? (laughs) My whole goal here is to open your heart, not to close it, you know. Um, But there's a beauty there. There's a beauty that exists there in creation to be one with the maker. That is a creator, right? That I too can create the world around me and it starts with my ideology. And that I can get into this deep place where I can see over time through self-sacrifice, through working with others, through the making of the amends, the taking of the inventory, through the, the, the being honest about me stumbling through all those processes, right? That's where it's huge. I, have, I love sex, you know? I love attention. I love a lot of things that I still pursue with an avidity that might be alarming to some. And... <laughs> And so I have to be honest about that when I get asked to do something like this because I want to be sure that you guys know who you're talking to. I'm a guy who doesn't have a college degree, you know, and I'm proud. I'm okay with that, you know. I'm a guy who uh, struggles with uh, sex, money, uh, reputation, and looking good and feeling better. And And I love that rascal side of me. I love it now. I've learned to give it love because if it, it's there. 
It's there. And I'll tell you what, it being there and me hating it and locking it in the room the same way my stepdad did to me when I was a kid, it just makes me act out five times harder, right? We got to be where we're at. Can't be anywhere else than where we're at. And, and so I've had to learn how to give all of my ugly pieces love, all, this, all the pain and judgment. The, I feel like this is the experience I had. The harder I judge you, that comes from a part of me that I am unwilling to love. It's easier to burn the monster in the street than it is to confront the monster in the mirror, right? And reach out and say, it's all right, you're there, Bubba. You know, it's okay. It's okay to be a little crazy. It's okay to be a little emotionally needy sometimes. Who wouldn't be with your upbringing? Who wouldn't be? It's okay. And I talk to myself that way. And that has been a part of my journey of development is learning how to give love to that. I'm like a baby in a monster truck, you know, sometimes. And uh, it's dangerous. <laughs> it's dangerous. Especially, and what's even more dangerous, a real act of faith is getting asked to come do something like this. You know, because I could literally say whatever I want up here. You guys could have to sit through all of it. I mean, it is just a tremendous act of hoping I'm going to follow the rules. It is. <laughs> but I don't have to. I mean, let's be clear. It's <laughs> so that's how I feel like that in, is an illustration of how the world actually works, that it's never certain that there is no certainty, that it all just kind of flows, and that if it breaks apart, it collects again over here. Everything in my life, every time I thought I'd been abandoned, I'd never been abandoned. I've always been taken care of. I've always been guided. You know, this year has been an incredibly... I mean, in, in sobriety, I, I, I didn't have any money, and I had an impoverished mind. And I came to find through 10 and 11 that those two are connected. The same way that I feel I'm unworthy of love, so I choose women who will not love me or who will leave and prove that I don't deserve love, right? Or I choose jobs that are, that are beneath me or that are easy to do because I don't want to challenge myself and take the risk of failing because I don't feel like I'm worthy of success. There is also this, uh, this part of me that uh, I lost it. Yeah, it is. I was probably trying to sound smarter than I am. And uh, so it just leaked right out the bottom of the cup. It's just, you know. <laughs> there is, I th well, I think, oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Impoverished mind. Of, yeah, po yeah, no, no, no. I'm definitely not too smart for that. But, uh, but I, I started to see also that, like, I, I had this limiting belief in the way that I viewed myself and money. And I didn't view it as a tool of love and service, and I didn't view it as something that is just a measurement. It's not really actually real at all, right? It's just kind of a, you can't run out of inches on a ruler. It's like running out of money, you know? It's like there's, you can't really, the, the whole idea and the concept of the economy is just wild to me. It's a total fiction. But... Uh, me thinking I'm poor resulted in me constantly being poor. Me thinking I deserve that, and that's where I come from, and I had this impoverished mind. I'd always make decisions that would reconfirm my impoverished mind. And, um, and so I started trying to take a look. I was finally ready this last... I mean, I, I, I got involved in real estate and made great money, and then I lost it all on a bad, bad partnership that I couldn't oversee. And my relationship at the time was falling apart. And the AA girl I'd met on AA campus and her AA little kid that I was helping to raise and break the chain of childhood abuse that I'd existed in, you know, be able, I was so afraid to try to help that little girl. I was so afraid to try to love that little girl because I was abused. And I thought that with my temper somehow, some way who that was looking down at me, would be who I was looking down at her. So terrified. I'd rather run. But I hung in there. I stuck in there with the support and love of other people. And, and at the end of that, I was doing all this stuff, and I was feeling good. I was looking good and feeling better. My bank account was bigger than it had ever been, and I got involved in a poor partnership, and I didn't want to oversee it anymore because my relationship was falling apart. And at the end of it, she ended up leaving, and we couldn't connect. And I remember her telling me the exact same thing the belly dancer told me when she ran away with a sword juggler. That's, not a, that's a real story. <laughs> and, and so... 
I understood, I understood that I was the one who had to change unless I wanted to recreate the circumstances in my life over and over and over and over and over again. And so she left, and I, when I was devastated, and the child was gone too, and I was stuck with an extra dog I'd bought for her daughter, and so I had two dogs now, and I love them, Dante and Virgil, the best. And, uh, and I thought to myself, at least I got my money. And then two weeks later, <laughs> I didn't have that either, you know? And then losing the two distinguishing f features of the Western man, <laughs> you know, the relationship and the money, the value, I launched off into a quest of hodum, you know, like I just went, I went to try to, <laughs> I came, I felt like I was guided by a golden scepter, you know, <laughs> I've been given self-esteem, <laughs> some self-awareness, moderate good looks from a protozoa to a woodland mammal, you know, like I, I'm, let's do this, and, and up to a point, that began to be the only thing in my life that was happening besides speaking for AA and sponsoring guys. <laughs> and right around there is, is where I started to confront some of those beliefs, even at a deeper level. And that's when I realized, man, I am just settling for everything all the time because this is easy, you know? And I started taking a look at myself. And I remember being with Ralph uh, out in uh, Minnesota, but through Fargo and him talking about power tools. The spiritual tools are power tools. And I really started to think about that. And I steal it now. And, uh, but the thing about it is that this, what am I gonna build with my power tools, right? Because after a time, it's all about this relinquishment of full control, relinquishment of power. I don't have it anymore. I'm powerless. I'll eternally be powerless. I'm going to live. And, there, and after a time, and after the experience of the 12 steps, that frame of mind for me became disempowering after a certain point because I stopped taking responsibility for the, the actions I took and sometimes even the thoughts I would pursue. Because again, remember, this is a nu I started to see this is a nuclear reactor I got in between my temples. This has the ability to light cities or destroy them. You know? There is a lot here. What I think becomes what I do, and what I do becomes my life. And in the 11-step practice, I've started to see that certain things are based in this fear and this lack and this scarcity and this... this this. There's enough in the world for everyone. There is enough fish. There are enough... There's enough food, there's enough potable water, there's enough shelter for every living creature on earth. The only thing that limits the access of those things is ideology. That's it. We've all decided, right? And I make those decisions on a daily basis that limit the infinitude of possibility that I have been impregnated with. There is a depth in all of us. There is a connection in all of us that I feel like I am connected to every single one of you. How could it be any other way? You know, Howard's gone. Where could he go? There's nowhere to go. Future doesn't exist. Past doesn't exist. They're figments of the imagination. They're conceptualizations. What I suffer from is imagination, and memory in the moment. That's all there is. And so the 10th and 11th step has become this focusing tool to remind me that there is a breath in me. I don't need to, I don't need to remind my body to breathe. There are certain systems in place. I don't grow my hair or my bones. You know, I don't access REM sleep to regenerate. I don't trigger apoptosis to, it's called regulated cell death. It's the thing where we say, hey, you're a different person every 10 years because your cells die and regenerate themselves. We don't have any say in that. The, the, the literal tens of thousands of processes in the human body that are keeping you afloat right now have nothing to do with your conscious thought. Is it such a stretch to think that there are systems at work in a greater degree that are operating under that same autonomy, that are automatically... It's, I believe that the world is a self-correcting organism. I believe that all of us are a nervous system, that we use each other and connect with each other. And just think about every single decision in your life. Has it ever really been yours? Or have you been guided? 
Have you been, has the same book been suggested three times and you finally pick it up and it makes an impact? Where did that suggestion come from? Is it all just coincidence? And so I'm a scientific guy. I can't help it, in case you picked up on it at all. <laughs> and neurotic, quite neurotic. And so the way that evolution works is there are, there are adaptive pressures. There's a pressure and an organism must adapt to the environment to survive, right? There's, there's random mutation. There's different sexual selection, kin selection, all this stuff. But essentially, there are pressures that force the organism, me, to survive. And I believe that that framework works out, instead of millions of years, it happens across one lifetime. It happens in Alcoholics Anonymous or in my life where I encounter things that force me to adapt in order to survive. There are things that are shaping me. And what is that force? What is that life force of circumstance and connection and suggestion and coincidence? What is that but this web that we're all a part of? You can't escape it. It's already a part of you. And I spent five years of my sobriety looking for the web at a geographic destination, at an intellectual aha moment, at a somewhere other than here. And I've been a part of it forever. I'll be a part of it eternally. Howard is a part of it right now. We are all a part of it. We are visitors having a momentary experience in this body, and it is a dance. It is not a race. What's the purpose of dancing? Is it who ever dances the fastest? No. No, it's to enjoy the dance. It's to move. It's to, it's, well, some people use dance for a, another reason, you know? So maybe let's say music. <laughs> what is the purpose of music? <laughs> right? I just, I'm really grateful because I don't feel, how am I doing now? Five minutes done? Am I, five? I just don't feel sometimes, and this is, this is the great journey in Alcoholics Anonymous is to constantly remind myself that my feelings of unworthiness were given to me. It's to constantly understand that my feelings of unworthiness were given to me. They're not your fault. They're not my fault. But now we have a choice. There is a choice that emerges, you know? And that choice is I choose to love myself today. I choose to try to love you the best I can today. That that is the way, that, love everybody. When Ram Das, I love Ram Das. I don't know if anyone knows Ram Das, but I love him. And when he was leaving uh, Neem Karoli Baba, uh, his guru in the East, right? He sat there and, 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 and Karoli looked at him and said, and Ram Das said, well, what do I do? And he looked at him and he said, tell the truth and love everybody. And, and Ram Das said, well, I... I can, I can tell the truth, but I don't know if I can love everybody. And he pushed nose to nose and he said, tell the truth and love everybody. And, and that is what Alcoholics Anonymous, that's what I tell all my guys. It is the 12 steps condensed down into a single phrase. You can be obsessed with sex or money or power or reputation or uh, inconsistency or video games or food or whatever it is that you're what rabbit hole of self you're currently investigating. I'm just here to share that there's a couple of them. They're all the same thing. It's all the same thing. It's self manifested in various forms that try to get us all hopped up. You know, give me that dopamine. Give me that oxytocin. Give me that mesolimbic pathway, the reward center in the brain. I love it. Um, but there's something deeper at work here. There's something eternal. And then, and then I'm going to shut up after this one last story, okay? Uh, so Ramana Maharshi is another spiritual leader, a spiritual teacher. And he was, he was at his hut, and there was an American boy there, and there was a woman who was German, and she was very irate. She was yelling at the attendant. She was very upset. And this American boy, who was about 18 at the time, was looking and watching this whole thing go down. And finally, the attendant flustered comes to Ramana Maharshi and says, uh, says something in Hindi. And, and, uh, and, and Ramana, very politely, very calmly, anyone who knew him never saw him rise to anger in his entire existence. He just smiled and said something, and the man looked perplexed and then walked back and spoke with the German lady and went out. Later, when Ramana was giving his talk, this American boy asked, he said, what, what was all that about? And what was that woman so upset about? 
And Ramana said, well, she wanted her donation back. <laughs> she did no longer like it here. She wanted to leave and she wanted her money back. And the attendant didn't want to give it to her because she'd already been here for a month. <laughs> she'd eaten our food. She'd done this. And he said, well, what did you tell her? What did you, we've seen people in AA like this, right? <laughs> uh, he said, well, what did you, what did you uh, t- tell her? And, uh, and Ramana says, well, I told the attendant to give her her full money back plus 50 rupees and to feed her before she left. And the boy said, well, why? I mean, she was really mean. She was yelling at everyone. She was making a scene. And Ramana smiled and compassionately said, when she came here and gave us that donation, she gave it to herself. And when she asked for it back, she stole it from herself. And when she leaves here, she will live with having a hard time with money, having a hard time with connection, because there is only one self. We are all one. We are all one. We're just confused. So love everybody and tell the truth. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.